good morning and welcome to Northside. We are so glad you're here to worship Jesus with us today. Hey, we ask now that you find your seats as we give you a few important announcements and then begin our worship together. If you are here this morning for the first time, or maybe you're a returning guest, please fill out a guest connect card if you have not already, and you can place that in the offering basket, or you can fill out a digital guest card by scanning the QR code on the handouts or on the back table. We want to welcome you and let you know we're honored to have you here to worship with us this morning. We'll be having our church business meeting today after the morning service. We hope you will stay for this meeting as we reflect on God's goodness to the church and what is ahead for 2022. Just a reminder, we will not have any evening ministries tonight. We hope you have a great evening with your families. Hey, don't forget that prayer meeting will be starting at 6.30 instead of 7 on Wednesday nights. This change will be starting on February the 2nd. On February the 13th, which is Super Bowl Sunday, we'll be having our evening ministries. We will start our kids' ministry at 4.45 and then our adult Bible study at 5 p.m. Hey, I ask now that you stand if you are able as we read our call to worship together. That's settled my question. I didn't know if we should sit or stand, so Matt took care of that for us. Call to worship this morning is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. A uh, very uh, great passage of scripture that has had a lot of impact on my life. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to glory of God the Father. Abba, Father, we come before you this morning as a church that's ready to worship. We know we can only be ready and truly worship if your spirit has filled each and every one of our hearts. I pray, God, that uh, you would have a special anointing on our pastor this morning as he preaches the word of God and conducts the service and the business meeting to follow, that your spirit would just anoint him in a special way. But I pray also, Lord, for the anointing of your spirit on each and every one of us who will hear that word, that we would take that word and apply it to our lives. and following the example of Jesus, that we would humble ourselves, humble ourselves as servants of Almighty God, and that no matter where we were in our spiritual journey when we walked in that door, that we would be just a little bit more like your son Jesus when we walk out. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's remain standing. As we sing, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. When I found in the desert place, though I walked through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. 
Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Whose pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. here today and I'm excited again to be in the house of God. I'm always excited to be here. I'm here Monday through Friday usually and then I get to come again on Sunday. So I'm just happy to be here and happy you are here as well. You can go ahead and be seated this morning. If you're visiting with us today, uh, we want you to know that we're thankful that you're here and if you could fill out a guest card for us, they're on the back table back there, uh, we would greatly appreciate that just so we can get to know you a little better. I'm really excited today though because we have a first timer outside of the womb, right? Ren Dorothy is here for the first time, and I, I, I talked with them just as we were singing that song. I said, I feel like we should do the Lion King thing, where we hold her up in front of the church, and everyone applauds. We won't do that, but and then Josh asked if I had the little stuff that the monkey has I can put on her head, and we won't go that route, but just excited they are here, and she's a sweet baby girl. I joked with them on, uh, we saw them this week, and I joked with them saying, I think that side of the church might cave in, because everyone's going to want to rush over and see the baby, but she is precious, and uh, we're glad that they are here and glad that she's doing so well. Uh, if if uh, this is your first time, again, we're thankful you're here and hope the service is a help and a blessing to you. Today's schedule is a little bit different just because we have a, a lot of different things going on. We've got uh, Jamie Donnan with us, missionary to Laos, and we're excited to hear from her in a little while. Uh, we're going to have a baptism in the service. Um, and then we have our business meeting at the end of the service. So just a, a lot of different things happening. So songs will be cut a little short. Um, preaching is going to try to be cut a little short, but that, that is what it is. Some things you can't change. Uh, you can pray about that if it burdens your heart, but it'll be as long as it'll be. Um, but we're looking forward to a great day together. As far as the business meeting goes, we're going to start that about 10 minutes after the morning service is over, so we'll give people some time to mill around and you can talk and, and uh, greet each other, and then uh, we'll, we'll get started on that just so we don't take up your afternoon. And just a reminder, uh, we will not be back for evening service tonight. We take the last Sunday of the month off on evening service, and so you can hopefully enjoy some time at home or with your family or reading a good book or whatever else you want to do. Um, on Wednesday night, some had asked about an update on Kristen Malachuk, and we were praying for her. She had a baby last Saturday and ended up losing uh, two-thirds of her blood through that process, and she is home and up and walking around, and the baby is doing great, and it's just a, uh, such a praise, such a, a miracle, really. I mean, if this happened many years ago, she would have been gone, and uh, just thankful for the way that they were able to take care of her and uh, uh, take care of that baby, and certainly they saw God's uh, grace in that, and neither of them had given blood before, and now they're huge proponents of blood drives, <laughs> and so we're going to have another one coming up here soon. Uh, I think it's the 1st of March, um, and I'll keep you posted on that, uh, but if you can give blood, I know that there is a, a still a national so shortage for blood, and uh, certainly that's something we can do. Uh, Brianna, she always gets sick when she gives blood. She like just about passes out. But she said, I'm going to do it again anyways. I'm going to do it again anyways. So even if you're about to pass out, be like my wife and push through it. I like it for the snacks. I'm not going to lie. They give you free snacks afterwards. Typically have some good conversation with the person drawing your blood. Makes for a good time. Um, another announcement, just to make you aware, starting this coming Wednesday, our, our prayer meeting service is going to start at 6.30 instead of 7. Uh, we're going to try that and just see if it works better for people, if it's easier for your schedules. And uh, it's, it'll, it'll be one of those things we try. When I was, became pastor, I said, we'll probably try some things, and some things will flop, and some things will go well. 
That's what you do, right? You try and see what works. And so we're going to try it and see if it works. And if it's a flop, we'll blame the person who brought it up. I won't name any names here, but if you want to know, I can let you know who that was. Um, so we're going to uh, do our scripture reading now, and that's going to be in Matthew chapter 10 this morning, continuing in the passage that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse number 21, and we'll read down through verse number 28. If you would stand with me this morning for the reading of God's word. The Bible says this, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not, shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye among the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Let's pray. God, we ask that your blessing would be upon the reading of your word. And as we come to this passage today, God, I pray that we would remember um, these warnings that you gave to your followers, to your disciples. And uh, truthfully, God, you gave them a glimpse into what life did look like for them. They saw these things come to pass in their lifetime. And I pray as we understand uh, our call to follow you, that we would be willing to press through the difficulties and the hardship uh, to get your gospel to the world around us. God, I pray that we would prioritize that above all. I do pray this morning, if there's any here who have never trusted in Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day where they come to the understanding of how much they are loved by you and how you sent your son Jesus to die in their place. God, I pray that you would draw them to yourself through your spirit, that they would repent of their sins and turn to you by faith alone. We thank you again for the time that we can gather this morning. We pray that you'd be with all that we do. May it bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Remain standing as we sing another song.
to have somebody come and say they want to publicly testify of their faith in Jesus Christ, and they want to publicly identify with him, and that's what Carly has done. She um, shared her testimony with me on Wednesday, and um, when she was in sixth or seventh grade, was going through a difficult time, and uh, just realized that she needed somebody to walk with her in that time of life, and Jesus became that person as he saved her from her sins and changed her life, and just thankful for her testimony, her desire to follow Jesus. Um, I would ask you uh, to pray for our teenagers. Teenagers have a hard life. They, they have a lot of different things that, as we all do, that try to pull them away, uh, that can distract them, and I'm just thankful for uh, her desire to follow Jesus publicly today, and I would ask you to be praying for her. Now, she has a long speech she wants to give. <laughs> no, we assured her we wouldn't make her talk. Uh, we'll, we'll, is that okay? Are you Okay. You're good? Okay, good. <laughs> so we're going to baptize her now, and uh, I would ask you just celebrate with us as we do this, and uh, just so thankful for all uh, that God is doing and will continue to do in her life. So on Wednesday night, I showed her this is what we're going to do. So you go ahead and plug in. I'm going to drive you around. Yeah, there we go. Now we got it set. All right, Carly, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ and in obedience to his commands, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk in newness of life. Let's give her a round of applause. She's even smiling. She's even smiling. Um, we're going to, you can go ahead and start getting changed, but we're going to have Jamie come at this time, and she's going to share uh, about her ministry and what God is doing. If we could have somebody put the podium back over there. And uh, she's going to share what God has been doing through her and the ministry they have over there in Laos. And I'm excited to hear this, and I'll hear most of it from out here, but i got to change first. I'm not preaching like this. Good morning. Um, I've been in Laos 10 years now, so who knows what language will come out. Um, <laughs> it's good to be with all of you today, and um, yeah, especially I could be here to see a baptism as well. That's always exciting. Um, we had one on our team back January of last year, did it in a blow-up kiddie pool in somebody's yard, <laughs> so it was a little different. Um, the water was only about that deep, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's really exciting. So um, yeah, congratulations to Carly and to your church for um, having another one join uh, God's family. Um, so if you want to start the slideshow, um, I'm going to be try to be brief, 15, 20 minutes. Um, so it's going to be like water from a fire hose. Um, so just hold up your cup and whatever you catch is great. Um, yeah, so I have started my PowerPoint here um, with this photo. Uh, and this picture to me captures um, the paradox of the country of Laos. Um, it's a country of great beauty, um, but also one with great darkness. Um, and I think the colors on this screen aren't quite as vibrant as um, on some screens, but um, it was a really beautiful sunset that day. Um, and as the sun sets, it shines on this golden stupa, which is in the capital of Laos, which is Vientiane. Um, and every time you see it, it's just this really beautiful sight um, but at the same time, it's sad to realize that that golden stupa is there to bring honor and glory to the wrong thing. Um, and so I just wanted to start with this picture to remind us that life is complicated. <laughs> There's things that are beautiful and yet utterly dark at the same time. Um, and when this lights up every evening with the last gleams of the sunlight, um, it's a false hope and a false light that is being offered to the people there. Next. Um, for those of you who maybe have forgotten or are wondering where Laos is, if this is the first time you've heard me speak, um, it's squished in the Mekong region between Thailand and Vietnam. Um, it actually borders all five of the Mekong region countries, um, Vietnam, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, and a little tiny border with China. Um, so it is landlocked, um, which brings its own set of difficulties for a developing nation, um, but also it is a country of great diversity um, and a country that um, 
yeah, they're, they're trying to grow and develop, and yet there's just many things that have held them back, such as being landlocked. Um, the Vietnam War largely took part in Laos, um, and so they're still suffering the effects of unexploded bombs, um, even to this day. Um, so just a, that's a really brief background of Laos. It's also largely Buddhist nation, about 67%, so two-thirds of the nation, are Buddhist followers, although that doesn't mean they can describe to you what Buddhism is. Um, it's very much part of the culture and the worldview. Um, and they'll say to be Lao is to be Buddhist. They are, in most Lao people's minds, an inseparable combination. Um, so that means when someone is considering coming to Christ, that means, in their mind, leaving a part of their culture behind. And that's where a lot of issues come with family and society. Um, because they're being seen as rejecting not just the pieces of Buddhism, but all of their culture. Um, and there are many beautiful things in the culture that are great, um, are biblical, and I think come from God, but they're mixed in with all these other things that are not. Um, next. Um, so last time I was here, I was working on a farm, a pig farm, fish farm, chickens, goats, whatever you call it. Um, I won't go into that whole story right now. If you want to hear it, you can come talk to me later. Um, but about two years ago, I was asked to step into leadership for the operation mobilization team in Laos. Um, I'd been part of that team for about four or five years, and our team leader was stepping down um, to step into a new role within our region, and they asked me to take his space. Um, and after a lot of prayer, um, some tears, and a lot of begging that somebody else could do it, um, it, God made it really clear to me that this was the next step in my journey. Um, so last, so June 2020, uh, in the middle of a pandemic, I moved cross country from southern Laos up to the capital um, and took on leadership for our team of about 30 people there. Um, so here's, these are just a few pictures of our team. Um, we took a trip to a waterfall in October of 2020, um, just to have fun as a team, not realizing that would be our last big team event for a year. Um, we had a pretty easy time the beginning of the pandemic, um, but in April, this past April, we had a big outbreak and we're in and out of lockdowns until I came back to the States. Um, fortunately, things are, are easing up now um, and I'll be heading back in two weeks. Um, and after a 14 day hotel quarantine, then I'll be back on the ground with the team there. So our team in Laos, um, our main focus or our main model is through business as mission. Um, you cannot be in Laos on a tourist visa. Um, so we run four businesses and we're working on starting a preschool. I shouldn't say we, um, one of our teammates is starting a preschool in her village. Um, and so this gives us um, a platform for visas, yes, but it also gives us a legitimate presence in the community. Um, it gives us ways to interact with the people around us, um, and it, it helps people understand where we fit. <laughs> um, so we have two businesses that are run um, as businesses. We have uh, the people who work at them come in during the day. We have Bible studies and prayer meetings with them, and they're invited to all our team events, um, but they're not living with us. Um, and then we have two businesses that are specifically for discipleship. So we bring in young people, usually between the ages of about 17 or 18, up to 25, 26 years old. They live in our team house. They work at the businesses during the day, and they have extra Bible studies in the evenings and activities on the weekends. Um, we also have a preschool. Um, where one of our teammates who was in the original group with the, the original group of discipleship participants, um, she came to us a few years ago and said, I'd really like to start something in my village, um, a way to go back to my village, to do something that will serve them, that will help them, and a way to bring the gospel to that area. Um, so for the last four years, she's been working on starting this. Um, there's been a lot of 
difficulties with the local leadership um, because her family is the only Christian family in the village and they don't really like Christians. Um, so there's been, if you follow my newsletters, there's been a number of stories. Um, praise God right now, things seem to be getting better. Um, there was an issue with electricity poles that we had put in and then somebody came back and said we don't want those poles on our land even though they'd already agreed to it. Um, so she moved the poles and after a couple weeks later she said things are back to normal. We had dinner with that family the other night. We and My sister invited them over and we ate together and um, things seemed to be okay. Um, but her name um, in my newsletters I refer to her as Noi. Um, so you can pray for Noi. She's in her village, it's just her and her parents that are believers there. Um, so you can pray for her. We're looking for somebody to be a partner with her in that project and live in the village with her. Um, I think she's praying for a husband. I'll take anyone who will go up there with her. <laughs> so, um, But you can pray for her just for someone to be locally, physically present with her in that journey because it is a difficult place to be. Um, I mentioned two businesses that are connected directly with discipleship. Um, one of those is our cafe. Um, so we use the ca the cafe is a great place when COVID restrictions are low. We have lots of activities there on the weekends. Um, we've hosted birthday parties. Um, we have a monthly open mic night, so anyone can come in and sing a song or whatever. And then our staff will prepare a few songs that um, have a gospel thread to them. Um, and really through the cafe, it's, it's just a really great way to get to know the people in the community because people come in to a cafe regularly. It's not a fancy restaurant that people go to once a year. Um, it's just a little coffee shop with cheap meals. So there's a NGO, a non-governmental organization office, like right down the road from us. And some of their staff come in three times a week. Um, so it's a really great way for the staff who are working there, who are all part of our discipleship program, um, to be growing in their faith, but then also having the opportunities to get to know people outside of the program, to share their faith with them, um, and to be looking at the community around them and saying, what does this community need? How can we be active here? We also have a carpentry. Um, we found the cafe tended to only attract women um, so a few years ago, our team started a carpentry slash welding company, and they make custom furniture. Um, they use local wood, and it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's, I, I had them make me some furniture this last year. If, if I didn't already have furniture in my house, it would just be all of their stuff. Um, they do a really great job, and we, we teach them that any vocation can be done for the Lord. Um, you don't have to work in a church to be a Christian worker. You can be a Christian worker in a cafe, in a carpentry, in a farm, whatever it is you do. Um, and that they should do everything to the glory of God. And that means making high quality, good furniture that is beautiful. Um, so right now there's a few young men there um, then in the discipleship program, training them up and hoping that they and the young women at the cafe will be the next generation of Christian leaders in their own nation. Um, yep. We also want them to have opportunities to work out their faith physically. <laughs> um, so we've sent them, when uh, COVID restrictions allow, we've sent them to different parts of the country. Um, a number of times within the capital, we did some small food distributions in the areas around where we have team houses. Um, and community and helping one another is so important to Lao culture. So it was important that we as Christians participated in that. Um, so we did a number of rice and food distributions and then we they took, um, each house chose different verses, but um, verses of blessing from the Bible, um, saying with this food we, you know, we pray that God will bless you um, that he, you will know him, um, is the prayer, but, um, just using verses from the Bible and just saying, this is who we are, and we're not here, um, to coerce you into anything, but we just want to show God's love to you in a time of hardship. 
Um, we also sent a group up to one of the northern villages where three or four of the participants come from. Um, and they put an addition on the pastor's house so that they could have church um, in a larger room um, because the, the house was overflowing. Um, we did about half of that project last year. Um, then we ran out of time and money and supplies. Um, and then rainy season was coming, so they're planning to go back again this year in March and finish, finish off the addition. Um, they were able to finish it more than in this picture. Um, they got the roof on and the walls halfway up, so it's been a usable building. Um, but they're planning to go back in March to finish off the walls and paint it, and make it look like a nice usable place. So that was a lot of information. <laughs> um, if you have more questions, I'll be at the back after the service. Um, but before I close, I just want to give you um, kind of three steps you can take um, to be involved in what we're doing. Um, the first one, of course, is prayer. And I think that's something anyone can do. Um, so a couple very basic prayer requests. One is our goal is to see Lao people reaching Lao people. So Pray for that. That is the heart of our ministry, is to bring up young believers to a place where they're mature and discipling other believers. Um, everyone should be discipling someone. Even if you're six months in, find someone who's a weekend, um, and just to continue that cycle. Um, I'd also ask for prayer. I'm planning to travel back in about two weeks. I'm still working, waiting for a little bit of paperwork, and getting back can have some bumps in the road depending on how everything goes so just please pray for a safe journey back and a restful time in my 14 day quarantine um, yeah I'm trying to look at it as a time of rest and debrief and spending time with God so pray that I can keep that mindset on day 10 <laughs> um, next, the next step if um, you're interested you can give I want to Thank this church from the depths of my heart for your faithfulness, um, for your faithfulness to God and your faithfulness to his work in Laos by supporting me for a number of years. Um, during COVID, a number of my friends lost large portions of their support, and by God's grace, my support stayed completely stable. Um, so thank you for those of you in this church who are giving towards that and for the church itself for supporting me financially. Um, I have some information in the back. If you're interested in supporting the activities of our team, our larger team, I have information in the back. You can pick up a sheet or talk to me about it. Um, and the last step you can take is to go. You don't have to go to Laos, go wherever God's calling you. Um, but I just want to encourage those of you who are here today. If God is placing a burden on your heart to go somewhere, um, do it. <laughs> Um, if God is putting on your heart a burden to go somewhere for a week, encourage a miss missionary or work with them, do it. If God's calling you for longer term, don't be afraid of that call. Um, but on the other end, if God has called you to a work and a vocation here in your local community, that is vital also to God's kingdom. Um, so whichever way God is leading you, do that thing. Um, someone who goes when they're not called is disobeying as much as somebody who stays when they are. Um, so I just want to encourage you in that. Thank you for your faithfulness to God. Um, Laos is pretty close at the moment, but in a year from now, or two years from now, um, it'd be great if a couple people wanted to come visit. I can show you around what we're doing in more depth. Um, yeah, and, and just feel free to contact me. I have a sign-up sheet in the back if you'd like to get my newsletters which I send out monthly. Um, and I also have some candy in the back for you to try, which is from Laos, and I promise it tastes good. <laughs> um, so thank you for giving me time this morning to share. Um, and come check out my table in the back and see how you can be connected um, or answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie, for that. Uh, let's give her a round of applause for all the hard work she does. Um, certainly grateful for our missionaries, and I think we'll look at the calendar and just plan a missions trip to Laos. Let's go, right? Pack your bags. We're headed that way. 
just want to encourage you in a couple of things concerning her. Um, if you would like to give towards them, uh, her, her mission and the, the work that they're doing there, you can drop that in the offering basket in the back and we'll uh, be sure to get her a check today. If you didn't come prepared to give, we know how to get her money. So you just let us know and uh, we're, we're excited to be able to partner with her. We do have a gift for her already. They're on the back table, I put it. There's a gallon of maple syrup. So hopefully that can make it with you uh, back to Laos and you can enjoy that over there. And I would encourage you to sign up for the, her prayer letter. Uh, we do uh, send out the prayer letters that we receive. Um, Matt does that once a week. Um, but if, if you would like to correspond with her personally, I'm sure that uh, you can sign up for that and, and begin writing her and, and just learning more about the ministry there. And then I would encourage you at the end of service to stop by the table and uh, just get to know her a little better, ask some questions, and uh, just encourage her along the way. I'm thankful for the, those who, um, as she said, have have been obedient to God in staying, and I'm thankful for those who have been obedient to God in going. And we're not, all of us can't do everything, as we say so often, but all of us can do something, and we should have a desire to do what God lays in our hearts. And uh, her wrap-up there really tied in well with our theme for the year of follow. And uh, that's our goal, that we just follow Jesus wherever he has us, wherever he calls us, that we would just simply follow him. We're going to sing one more song this morning, and so if the team would come back up, and then we'll get into the, the message after that. By faith, by faith. Children's Church can be dismissed at this time. Uh, Matt and Kayla are going down there, so you guys can head on down and have a good time down there learning from the Bible. Just a couple of things I meant to mention earlier. I just want to thank the church again um, just for all that they've done this week with the passing of Maisie, and I know Matt has been so appreciative of it and his family, and I would ask you just to continue to pray for his family and him as they go through this time. There's certainly 
um, a long road ahead of them, and uh, I would just encourage you to encourage them along the way. Uh, but again, I'm thankful for Matt's testimony through it all, and certainly that's by God's grace. Uh, the second thing is just be praying. There's a couple people in church that do have COVID right now. Just be praying for them. And nobody seems too seriously ill with it, which is a good thing, but just continue to pray for them and other people in the church who are dealing with other sicknesses as well. Uh, Matthew chapter 10 is where we're going to be this morning. Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse number 21 and looking down through verse number 28. And the title of our time together this morning is Fear the Right Thing. And this is a part of our follow series. And kind of the, the subtitle or subline to our series has been this, Surrendering Ourselves to the King. And as we go through the commands of Jesus through the book of Matthew, it's our desire uh, to look at them and see how they applied then, but also how they apply uh, to us today. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that the Word of God is timeless, that there's truths within it that do not just pertain to those who lived back then, but they can still work in our hearts and lives today. And we should allow them to work in our hearts. We should desire them to work in our hearts and lives today. And so as we look at this passage, uh, we see it's another passage where Jesus is teaching, and he's teaching some tough truths. Uh, but as we go through this, I pray that our hearts would be softened to what he has for us this morning and that we would be obedient to him. Two weeks ago, I felt I did an adequate job of sharing with you all the fears that I have in my life. Many of you remember that. So if you came this morning uh, hoping to get a deeper glimpse into my life or what I'm afraid of, you're going to have to wait until another time, um, but I'm sure it will come up again. But all, all joking aside, uh, the truth is we all have things that we are fearful of. We all have things that cause us to lose sleep at night. We all have things that push us over the edge. But as Jesus is speaking here, he's reminding us that as followers of Christ, we're to fear the right thing. He's saying that there should be a fear in your life. There should be an element of fear in your life, but it needs to be focused in the right direction and really on the right person. As we know, our world is ever-changing, and the last two years have certainly been a testament to that. We don't know what a day will bring. We don't know when a tragedy will occur. We don't know when a trial will come and run us off the road. And with all these unknown variables in our lives, it seems that we would have reason to be constantly on edge, to be constantly biting our fingernails, and to be living in almost a panic mode 100% of the time. But as believers, this is not the life that we're called to. In fact, we're the best representation of Christ when we stay even-keeled and steady and stable in a world that is shifting and changing all around us. But how do we do that? I think we would all want that quality. We would all want to live as a steady person 100% of the time. But how can this be a reality? Because we know it's not a natural response, and we know it's not normal. But I would submit to us today that it is something we can have in our lives as we follow the leading of the Spirit of God and as we stay surrendered to the King. We're given many examples in Scripture of men and women who face great trials, and yet they remain steadfast. And if you read through Paul's writings, remaining steadfast is one of the commands that Christ has given to his church, that we wouldn't be tossed all around, that we wouldn't follow doctrines of men, that we wouldn't allow the trials of this life to pull us off mission and to pull us off the path that God wants us to be on. So the Spirit of God and the Word of God brings a level-headedness to our lives that we could never attain on our own. But I think it's important as we tease this out and as we go through this passage that our surrender also has a lot to do with it. Because the Spirit of God does not change, and the Word of God does not change. But what's the variable in that equation? It's how surrendered I stay to God. It's how focused I stay on Him. It's how in tune I walk with Him as He leads me in this life. And so Jesus, as He is teaching His followers, uh, it would seem that He's urging them to follow Him through trials and storms. And He's encouraging them to know that when they fear the right thing, they'll be given a new and better and maybe even an eternal perspective. And this will help them navigate the trials of life with a supernatural confidence. The big idea this morning that I want to look at is this. Life will be hard, and we will face challenges. But as believers, we can rise above a temporal perspective of fear as we stay surrendered to the King. I want to see three things this morning out of this text, hopefully rather briefly. And uh, I pray that as we go through them that they would be a help to you, as I believe they were to the original audience when Jesus was speaking. The first thing we see this morning is the narrow path. In verses 21 through 25, Jesus outlines 
a great road of difficulty that he was anticipating and that his followers should have anticipated for themselves. Jesus, as we know, faced these things. He went through great trials for the faith. He went through great trials so that we could have a faith delivered to us. And as he's looking at his followers and as he's understanding the things that would come into their lives, he's warning them that these things will be a reality. And I want to read them again. He says, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father of the child and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. I think we've all had issues with our kids. None of us have faced that yet, right? And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the city of, cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more should they call them of his household? So the first thing that we see this morning in this passage is the narrow path. And as I read that passage of scripture, my mind was really going all over the place as I tried to understand what, it, what is it that Jesus is getting at? What is it that he's trying to outline for his disciples? Obviously, he's relaying to them that persecution was going to come, that trials would come, that they would face hardships. And as I read through that passage, my mind went back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says this in verses 13 and 14, enter ye into the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And so in essence, Jesus is reminding them of what he's already told them. That your life is going to be hard, and I'm going to encourage you to walk the narrow path. I'm going to encourage you to choose the road uh, that's less traveled, so to speak. I'm going to encourage you to, to go through the door that is labeled difficulties and trials. And if we're honest, that would be the door that we would shy away from, right? If we had a door that was labeled difficulty and trial and a door that was labeled ease and success, I would say that the majority of us would want to go knocking on the door of ease and success. Why? Because we like things that are easy. We like things that are simple. We like things that are not complicated, but Jesus is saying here, if you're going to be my follower, if you're going to be my servant, if I'm going to be your master, then you must understand that life is going to be hard. And I want to outline this ahead of time before we go through this passage. I don't think that Jesus is saying you need to go through life looking for trials. But I think what he is saying is this, you need to understand that in this life, if you're going to follow me, then trials will be a reality. That you will be hated for my name's sake that father will rise up against son, and son will rise up against father. And while we don't see this as a reality in our world, friend, there is many places in the world where it is a reality, where people are choosing faith in Christ over familial relationships, where they're choosing a, a dedicated relationship to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior over what is easy and what is comfortable. And, and as Jesus was outlining these things for his followers then, they were not in that moment experiencing those things, but they would. And so it does apply to us because we too are not per se, experiencing what is outlined in this passage of Scripture. But let us live with the reality that these things could be a reality in our lives in the future. I'm not a, a naysayer. I'm not going to predict what's coming and when it's coming. But I will say this, that for believers uh, who live in this day and age, I think we will begin to experience a new level of difficulty in our lifetime. And so what do we do? Well, we determine to follow. We stay surrendered to the king. We press on in the midst of hardship because we understand that Jesus is indeed worth following. And so as Jesus unloads on his disciples in Matthew 10, he's continuing the discourse that we saw two weeks ago, and he's giving them a deeper understanding about what the, nat uh, the, the narrow way actually entails. Last week or last time, Jesus said, beware of men, for they will deliver you up into councils and they would bring you before governors and kings and they would scourge you and they would make your life difficult. But here, as the passage continues, Jesus goes on and we see that this idea of the hard road becomes even harder as he talks about our allegiance to Christ could affect the relationships that mean the most to us. You see, the truth is, and I think it's true for all of us, that 
if we're walking down Main Street and somebody says something to us that is hurtful, then most of us, maybe after a little time, could allow that thing to roll off our backs. Like, not a big deal. You don't know me. You don't know what I'm about. But what about when that mean or hurtful thing becomes much more personal? What if you begin to be criticized for the decisions you make and how you follow Christ from those who you love the deepest? Jesus says this is what the narrow path is going to be like. This is what we have to prepare ourselves for. It will be hard. It will be difficult. It will cause great conflict in our hearts and in our minds, and we will wonder if it's worth it. But Jesus is saying in the end, it will be worth it. It will be worth it. And if it causes you to lose relationships or if it causes your life to be taken from you, in the end, follower of Jesus, it will be worth it. And this is what the narrow path is. It's a little confusing, though. Because Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, again, he says, Enter into the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. And if we understand what Jesus is saying, he says the broad way is the one that's supposed to lead to destruction and the narrow way is the one that's supposed to be lead to life. But why does it seem like it's flopped here? Well, it's flopped because we have misunderstood what life and hardship really are, what life and death really are. And Jesus is saying, if you choose the narrow path, you will be led to eternal destruction. I'm sorry, if you choose the broad path, you'll be led to eternal destruction. But if you choose the narrow path, you'll be led to life. But the narrow path in Matthew chapter 10 doesn't seem like it leads to life. It seems like it leads to death. And the reason we often think that way is because we live with such a temporal mindset. Jesus is saying if you're on the narrow path, you will be led to eternal destruction. If you're on the broad path, you'll be led to eternal destruction. I'll get these right one of these days. But if you're on the narrow path, you'll be led to life. And though your life may be taken from you in this life, and though it might bring hardship and difficulty, the life that we experience in the next will bring us an understanding that it was all indeed worth it. So Jesus says, as, as a basic understanding of what's going on in this text, that you'll be hated of all men, in verse 22, for my name's sake, but if you endure, you will be saved. In verse 23, they'll persecute you, but it's okay. Flee to another city. In verse 24, he says, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. If it happens to me, it will happen to you. In verse 25, if they criticize me, how much more will they criticize those that follow me? And Jesus uses the term Beelzebub here, and it's really a reference to Satan. They're calling Jesus Satan. And in Matthew chapter 9, we see that the Pharisees did the same thing as they criticized Jesus for his miracles. And so Jesus has said, this is already reality. They are calling me Satan. They're saying that I do the works that I do through the power of Satan. And if it's true for me, then it's going to be true for you as well. And so Jesus basically says, if you're going to walk the narrow path, be prepared. Be prepared because difficulties will come. Trials will flood into your life. Hardship will become a reality. Be prepared. But he also is encouraging them at the same time to continue to walk the narrow path. And when we see things like this, our response would often be, well, I'm just going to be a Christ follower, but I'm going to walk in my own way. Friend, do you understand that the Bible would never say that's okay? That as believers, we don't get to determine what our path is. We don't get to determine what walking as a Christian looks like. Jesus has given us what that means. Now, is there differences or variances in the way that some of us live our lives? For sure there is. But Jesus is saying the whole of our lives should look like his life. And when we choose to walk the narrow path, we can be assured that difficulties will come and be a part of us. And so again, the title is Fear the Right Thing. And as we fear the right thing, we'll choose to walk in the narrow path. The second thing that I want to see this morning is the wrong perspective. In verses 26 and 27, it says, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. But I tell you, in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. 
So what's the wrong perspective? Well, what, what is our natural response to the negative reaction of those who do not like our message or the way that we live our lives or the belief system that we hold to? I think there are several. Oftentimes, we react in one of these ways. We begin to quiet down in their presence or we begin to change the message that we proclaim. The second negative response that we can often have is that we begin to think of that person who doesn't like our message as the enemy. The third response that we can oftentimes have is that we simply become altogether silent and we no longer talk about our faith or talk about the things that we believe. The fourth response that I think happens oftentimes is that we, we can become belligerent against those who would speak out against our faith. And the reality is, as we think of those four responses, all of them are drawn from fear. We quiet down because we're fear. We think of them as the enemy because we're fearful. We become altogether silent because we're fearful, or we become belligerent because we're fearful. And Jesus, in this passage, is reminding us that we're called to fear the right thing. And so, in verses 26 and 27, he begins with this phrase, fear them not, but wait, Jesus. You just said that those that are closest to me could deliver me up to be killed, that, they would, that, that I would be at odds with, with the family that I love so dearly. You're talking about religious officials uh, delivering me up to be scourged and, and to be hated of all men. And, and now you're telling me to fear not? Doesn't it seem a little backwards? Wouldn't it have been much more easy if Jesus said, and it's okay if you're a little afraid. It's okay if you tailor your life to the situation that you're currently in. We would like it if Jesus said, it's okay if your Christianity becomes cultural and you adapt based on where you are and who you are in front of. That's not what Jesus says. He says, as you go through these difficulties and as you're delivered uh, to the council and as people hate you for my name's sake, the advice that he goes on to give them is, fear them not. Why? For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. And I think this is twofold. I think in part Jesus is saying that their works will be revealed, that they were enemies of Christ and that they caused servants of Christ to be put to death, that that thing that is covered will be made known. But I think Jesus is also saying that your sacrifice, which may be covered up by the masses of people, will also be made known that your testimony will serve as an opportunity for others to gain courage. Isn't it Paul who said that, that by my imprisonment, those around me are much more bold to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? And while they're trying to conceal me, the reality is the faith was spreading like a wildfire because people were understanding that these things were indeed true. And so Jesus looks to his followers and says, life is going to be hard. Families are going to be torn apart. Your life could be taken from you, but fear not fear not, because I've got your back. In verse 27, he goes on and says, what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Well, what is Jesus talking about? I believe he's talking about the gospel. I believe he's talking about the truths that he had delivered to them. If you read through the gospels, how many times did Jesus tell a group of people, you don't understand because you don't have ears to hear? But the disciples were given ears to hear. Jesus was teaching them. He was training them. He was leading them along in the truth. And Jesus is saying, I want you to continue to preach this message, what you've heard in the darkness, what you've heard in private, what you've heard in the, the individual teaching that I have given you. I want you to go out and I want you to proclaim those truths from the housetop. But doesn't it seem a little counterproductive? Because if they do these things, their lives are going to be difficult. But what does Jesus say? Fear not. Just go. Go. Just go, and we often talk about the Great Commission being the Great Commission, but let us understand that before the Great Commission was given, there was other commissions that were given. This was always expected of followers of Jesus. He always urged them to be bold in the face of difficulties. And here, once again, he says, preach the truth from the housetops, and it will draw attention, and it will make your life harder, and it will make things more difficult. But let us understand, church, that this is the reason that he's left us on earth. It's not to have comfortable lives. 
It's not to have everything we want or desire. It's not to propagate our own message, but it's to make his name known. And the comforting thing is, as he tells us to fear not, that command of fear not is really a promise that you don't have to fear because I'm with you. All throughout the Bible, we see God speak to his people that I'll be with you. One of my favorite passages is in Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. It says this, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by, my, by name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Fear not. And so, church, I would encourage us as we live in 2022. How many of you, by the way, have written the wrong year on your checks? Anybody got that straightened out yet? I struggled this morning, but I finally got it right. But as we live in 2022... Let us be honest with ourselves that oftentimes we live with the wrong perspective. That we fear what's going on around us more than we fear the one who deserves to be feared. That we walk in our anxiety, that we walk in our doubts, that we walk in our questions, and we allow those to have more control over us than the God who has redeemed us. And so let us take his promise to heart, fear not, for I will be with thee. And so Jesus says, this is the narrow path. Life will be difficult. And then he says, this is the wrong perspective. When we fear them, when we give them uh, too much of our time and attention, when we give them uh, too much of our anxiety or we allow them to have too much control over our lives, we're fearing the wrong thing. But then finally, in verse 28, he unpacks for us what the right fear is. In verse 28, Jesus says this, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And that sounds like an intimidating verse. What is Jesus saying? What does he mean? And I think in my mind, and as I studied through this, what he's he's really getting across to us is that there are things that are worth fearing, and there are things that are not worth fearing. With this idea of fear, certainly we understand that it has this idea of reverence or respect. We have this idea that it, it should cause us to be in awe. Um, we understand that it has this idea of terror, that it should cause us to flee uh, out, of, out of fear over what is befalling us. But, but I think one place that we often miss within Christian circles is this fear also has an element of worship to it. And if we look at what Jesus is saying, and he says, fear not those people that can do all these things to you, do you know what he's saying? He's saying, don't worship those things. Don't give them the time and attention that I alone deserve. Don't allow them to have control in your life when I'm the one who should be dictating what you do and where you go and how you speak and how you live your life. And we would never really like to look at it this way because if we're honest, we all have things that we fear, but we would never like to to put that in the category of worship. Why? Because we understand that worship belongs to who? Belongs to God. And so we like to label those in a different way or think about them in a different way. And I'm not saying that fear and anxiety of things in this life are not a reality because they are. I went to my yearly physical on Wednesday, and I will say the doctor said, you are in perfect health. And I, I don't know how much I have to pay you to say that, but I appreciate what you just... Can you write it down for my wife, please? Please write that down. And we began talking, many of you know, back in August, I had just some heart issues. And, and I believe now they're just connected to stress and anxiety and things that are difficult to process. And I know many of you face the same thing. And it's nothing life-threatening. She said it's just your body is giving you a sign that you're, you're focused on something that is taking too much of your time and attention, that you need a break from that thing. And in part, I wish she could say, you have a medical issue that we could fix, right? Because that'd be a whole lot easier. But as a believer, in, in my certain situation, and I'm not going to tell you that this is true for you, but in my situation, everyone understands, I'm not saying this is true for you, right? Everyone nod your head. I don't want people leaving here saying, Dan says my anxiety is not real. That's not what I'm saying at all. But for my life, I have come to the understanding over the last six months 
that I was allowing too many small things to creep into my life that I was giving my time and attention to. That I was letting them take over my mind and my heart and my thoughts. And I would lay there in bed at night and my heart would go crazy. And why was that? Because I'm focused on the wrong thing. A couple months ago, I woke up in the middle of the night and I felt like I was drowning. I couldn't breathe. Like, I sat up in bed, and, and I'm gasping for air. And like, Brianna says, what can I do for you? I, I was like, I don't know. She said, I'm, I'm just going to pray for you. And the truth is, that's what I needed. And that's what we need to learn to do. And so we often probably would say about ourselves, I fear the right thing. I don't, I don't fear the wrong thing. But I think if we look into our lives and the amount of time and attention that we give to things that are not going to matter a drop in eternity, that we could all probably find areas of our lives that we're fearing the wrong thing instead of fearing the right thing. Side note again, I'm not saying your anxiety is not real. Don't take that away from this. But I am saying for my life, in my experience, that when I could pinpoint the cause of my anxiety that I was able to, to gain victory over that thing when I gave it to the one who's ultimately in control. So fear the right thing. Jesus says, fear them not, which can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And I think what Jesus is saying is this, is that we're giving too much of our time and attention to lesser things. And, and as I was thinking about this in my life, what Jesus is not saying is this. He's not saying... There's a list of things that we should fear and that Jesus is at the top of the list. He's saying there's one thing that should be feared. And it's him alone. Now, that means that we have to reorient our lives, right? Because so often each of us live with some sort of fear. We live and give ourselves to things that may never be a reality. We allow ourselves to get carried down a path of things that could or might happen, and those things are difficult, and they do grip us, and they do have a power over us, but friend, in those moments, we must understand that those things are not to be feared. Yes, we can walk in wisdom in those things, and yes, we can seek to figure those things out, and yes, we can seek to alleviate a load, but those things should never have the fear that God alone deserves. Those things should never have the worship that God alone deserves. Those things should never take the majority of our time and effort and energy when there's one alone who deserves those things. And so Jesus said, Says, fear the right thing. Spurgeon says this, there is no cure for the fear of men like the fear of God. Hmm. There is no cure for the fear of men like the fear of God. And so earlier in this passage, as we saw a couple weeks ago, this is why Jesus could say, I send you forth as sheep into the midst of wolves. And they will scourge you. And they will deliver you up. And they will mock you. And they will hate you. But don't fear them. Because there's only one who deserves to be feared. So as I said, we can often get hung up on one element of fear. And maybe that's that we focus on the wrath of God or the terror of God or the reverence of God or the worship of God, but I honestly believe that we have the right understanding of fear when we live in the full scope of what the word means. That I do follow him because he's commanded me to, but I do follow him because I love him because he first loved me. And when we fear the right thing, then we'll be willing to take risks that cause us to look like lunatics to the world around us. Do you know much of the world would look at Jamie and the skills that she has and think that girl's crazy to go spend her time in a mission field when she could probably get some executive position here in the States and live a very different life. The world says she's crazy. Jesus doesn't say she's crazy. When we fear the right thing, We'll be, living, we'll be willing to live in a countercultural way for the sake of the gospel. And does it mean 
that people will think we're odd at times. Yeah, it certainly does mean that people will think we're odd. And guess what, church? That's okay. Because we are called to be different. When we live or when we fear the right thing, we'll be willing to pass by momentary pleasure that would seek to lure us away from eternal joy. And when we fear the right thing, we'll be able to drown out the voice of the enemy that would influence us away from the mission of Christ. The psalmist says this in Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Solomon in Ecclesiastes, the wisest man who ever spoke, in chapter 12 and verses 13 and 14 says this, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And so church, I would ask us this morning, what are we living in fear of? As we close, I have a couple of things that I'd just like to highlight. And they're questions that if you want them later, I'll give them to you. I didn't put them in your notes. But the first one is this. How are the fears that we have shaping our children? The parents in the room? The things you talk about? the things you prepare for. I think sometimes we spend more time preparing for an apocalypse where we'll be the last man standing than we do preparing, before, than we do preparing to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So how are the fears we have shaping our children? What things do we talk about in front of them? What things do they know of us because of what cripples us? The second thing, is how are our fears shaping our witness? In the world that we live and the people that we're around, if we go to them and say, hey, I've trusted in Jesus as my Savior, and he's promised to give me a home in heaven, he's wiped away my sins, and yet we live in fear of everything else that this world has, what are they going to think of our faith? The third one is this, how are our fears shaping the way that we spend our time and our efforts. We've often talked about the blessings that God has poured into our lives, and certainly we all have things that we use for one purpose or another, but how are our fears shaping the way that we spend our time and efforts? I wonder this next one, how are our fears shaping the space in our, our minds that wanders? Anybody ever just lay in bed at night and think of the worst of the worst? And so as Jesus speaks to his disciples here, he's encouraging them to understand that there is something to be feared, but it all needs to be in perspective. He, he is letting them know that life will be difficult, but those are not the things that should consume our time and our energy. He is letting them know that, that life will be hard. But in all of the difficulty, in all of the hardness, in all of the trial and torment, there is one to be feared, and it's God and God alone. I love what Paul says in the book of Timothy, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And if there's something that our world needs today, it's believers who are living with a sound mind. I know some here today will say, well, Dan is talking about current circumstances, whether it be COVID or anything else. The truth is, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Dan, Dan's talking about a political spectrum that, that we need to not... I'm, I'm not talking about any of those things. Or maybe I am talking about all those things. The truth is, God can work in your heart where you've given yourself to fears that don't belong there, and God can work in my heart where I've given myself to fears that don't belong. And so this is not a one-sided or one-way message. It's a message to hopefully encourage the church to fear the right thing. Certainly we walk in wisdom in this world, right? Certainly walking in wisdom is not always fear. Making good choices based on information you have is not fear. It's not fear-based. 
But above all, we choose to follow him wherever he leads us, wherever he would have us to go. We could all have a conversation in this room when the service is over and we could all talk about our fears with one another only to have them be criticized or belittled or cast off as nothing or or minimized. Because my fear is not necessarily your fear and your fear is not my fear. But when we walk in the way of Christ, we're called to fear one thing. And this one thing will help us overcome every other attempt of fear that this world could hurl at us. The big idea that we began with is this, life will be hard and we will face challenges. But as believers, we can rise above a temporal perspective of fear as we stay surrendered to the King. As I was going over my notes yesterday, this thought came to my mind and and it's just simply this. And I think I've shared a little bit with you already, but the things that we fear most in this world will be nothing when we make it to heaven. Nothing. The things that cripple me and grab my attention and don't allow me to sleep at night, the things that give me anxiety, all of those things are going to be wiped away one day. So why would I fear? Why would I fear? Jesus says fear the right thing. Well, we know it's easy to get distracted. We all do. And if we're honest, we get distracted daily. But as we fe- seek to follow, the truth is he will lead us to overcome those distractions and he will keep us moving in the right direction. And so I would ask us, church, what do we fear? And what do we need to change in our lives so that we fear the right thing? God, we love you. And we thank you for this day that we can gather in your house. We thank you for the truths of your word that we can cling to. And God, I pray this morning that you would take your word and you would rightly apply it to our hearts and our lives. God, I pray that that we would do an assessment of our own lives. And certainly, it's easy for us to look into those around us and say, well, they're fearing this or they're scared of that. But God, I pray that instead of that, we would look into our own lives and say, God, where have I been fearful? What have I been worshiping in place of you? So God, I pray that you would help us, help us to be honest, help us to listen to your spirit, help us to be sensitive to his leading, and may we all be better for it as we seek to follow you. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. With your heads bowed just for a minute. As we've gone through this passage today, certainly the the whole of the passage, Jesus is talking to his disciples. But Jesus makes an interesting statement as he talks about not fearing him who can destroy your body, but he talks about the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. If you're here today and you're not a believer, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never repented of your sins and turned to him, then I I, I would beg of you to understand this truth that one day you will be eternally destroyed. And you say, well, that doesn't sound like a loving God. It doesn't sound like the God that I've heard of in my past. You see, the flip side of it is he is a loving God because he's made a way for you to escape that eternal punishment. You say, is it through my good works? Is it through me being a good person? Is it through me giving money to this missionary that was here today? And I would say, no, it's, it's absolutely none of those things. It's not in what you can do, but it's, it's through what's been done for you through the person of Jesus Christ. And this Jesus that was speaking to his disciples would eventually, in a short period of time, be crucified on a cross, not for things that he had done, but he died for the sins of the world. And Jesus says in John 3.16 that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not die, should not be destroyed, but shall have eternal life. If you're here today and you have never trusted in Christ as your Savior, we're going to sing a song in a moment. And I would encourage you, if you feel the Spirit of God working in your heart and your life, I would ask you to meet me in the back and 
Me or someone else will go through the Word of God with you, and we will show you how you can be saved. And understand this, when you give your life to Jesus, He certainly gives you a hope that outlasts this world, but understand this as well, He gives you a hope in this world, right here, right now. And that's the hope that allows us to conquer the fears, the things that would grip our hearts and pull us away. And so as we sing in just a moment, if you have questions about how Jesus can be your Savior, I would encourage you to meet me in the back. And for those of us today who are saved, I pray as we sing that we would begin to evaluate our own hearts and lives. And we would ask ourselves, am I fearing the right thing or am I fearing the wrong thing? It's not a list. Jesus is not saying I need to be close to the top or at the top. He says, I'm the only one on the list. Fear me, and I'll lead you in this life. God, we ask that you'd work as we sing this song, that as we lift up our voices to worship, God, that you would be glorified. But I also pray in this contemplative moment, God, that our hearts would be stirred and that we would do an honest evaluation in our lives, that we would understand that there is one thing to be revered and feared and worshiped, and that is you alone. We pray that you'd work as only you can work in this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Dave, would you come? And as Dave comes, I would ask you to stand this morning, and as we sing, I pray that we would respond to him as he has worked in our hearts. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me then depart. No tongue can bid me then Heart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. To behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am. Glory and the grace. What with itself I cannot die. My soul is purchased with his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. Lord, I thank you for being here today, and I pray that the service was a blessing to you, um, from the singing to the, the scripture to uh, the presentation from Jamie, from the baptism. Uh, certainly, God is good to us, amen? amen? And as we see him working in and through our church, um, it's just an exciting, exciting place to be. Um, I heard somebody recently say this, this statement, that, that today is the most exciting day to be a Christian. You know, and I believe that. I, I truly do. But I think that's been true every day <laughs> up until this point. Why? Because God has always been working. God has always been moving. And we certainly believe that we're closer now uh, to his return than we've ever been before. But if it's, if it's another thousand years, then I would say the next thousand years are going to be the greatest days to be a Christian. Why? Because God is still on his throne. He hasn't lost control of the ship. He's still guiding it where he wants us, it to go. And he will land that thing when it's his time to land the ship. So I pray that you are encouraged today and that as we uh, leave after, if, if uh, you're staying for the business meeting, that's great. If you, when you leave, I just pray that you take something with you to encourage your heart. I do want to say this, if you're a visitor here that is not a member yet, you're welcome to sit in on the business meeting if you want to see how things run here. Um, obviously, uh, we would ask that you refrain from speaking or voting, uh, but if you'd like to sit in, you can certainly do that. And uh, 
we're not going to have child care, so if you can grab your kids, it's okay if they make a little bit of noise or a lot of bit of noise. We'll have microphones so we can talk loud. Uh, but I would encourage you, if you're a member, to stay and just rejoice with us in the good things that God has done at our church and the good things uh, that he is going to do. But let's dismiss an order of prayer, and uh, we'll let you get on your way. Ethan, you want to close us in prayer, please?